Hey, Susan, the last few weeks I've been followed online by ads for Noom. So I decided to check it out. Have you heard of Noom before? I have. So what caught my eye about Noom is that it's a personalized weight loss plan. Yeah, most weight loss plans are sort of a one size fits all deal. And that doesn't work when everyone leads such different, crazy, hectic lives. And I know for us, a big challenge of trying to eat right is being on the road a lot and between airports and, you know, me and the hotel breakfast bars. (laughs) (laughs) You do love those breakfast bars. Love those. A little too much. And that's why Noom is great. It addresses your lifestyle, your habits, and finds the issues in your life that are blocking your weight loss goals. It feels like a personalized weight loss plan to meet everyone's lifestyle. And the best thing about it, it doesn't seem to restrict what you eat and doesn't shame you when you choose to treat yourself. Hello, Manhattans. So if you want to get one of those uh, hotel waffles, you're good to go. (laughs) Look, you're going to have cravings. There's going to be things you want to eat. With Noom, you can. And Noom helps you lose weight while still enjoying your life. It also looks at your personal psychology. Losing weight starts with the brain. So why not look at your brain to see what would work for you? Stay focused on what's important to you with Noom's psychology and biology-based approach. Sign up for your trial today at Noom.com. And check out Noom's first ever cookbook, The Noom Kitchen, for 100 healthy and delicious recipes to promote better living. Available to buy now wherever books are sold. So don't forget, sign up for your trial today at Noom.com. The comfort of your favorite seat is now your comfy car selling command center, thanks to Carvana. It doesn't get any better than this. Your favorite seat's the best spot in the house. Make it even better by entering your license plate or VIN and getting a real offer in minutes. There really is no place like home. And speaking of home, Carvana will pick up your car from yours after you finalize your offer. Visit Carvana.com or download the app and sell your car from your comfy place. Let's go. Somebody want to tell me where we're going? Shorties. So this guy... Jacinda and I were in Manteca with Kevin and Dan, the cameraman, who you might recall from season one of Proof. He was with us on several trips to Rome. But at this moment in Manteca, Kevin and Dan were very confused. Because Jacinda and I had hopped into the van and said, Hey, you know all those plans we had for the afternoon? Forget that. We're going to go talk to Tim Fisher. Kevin and Dan had no idea who Tim Fisher was or why we wanted to talk to him. So while heading down the highway to hopefully speak to him, Jacinda and I had to get Kevin and Dan up to speed quick. So what do we know about where we, we're going to meet? We're going to wait at Shorty's to see if Tim comes. Mm-hmm. And, and sorry, just to preface this, Tim is, how is Tim related to? Okay, so Lewis was a friend of Jake's. This guy is friends. Well, he's actually like brothers. They're not biological brothers. And he has a brother, Tim, who a lot of people think could have done it or could know something or be responsible somehow. Or a lot of people say, you need to talk to Tim. Someone should talk to Tim. The mother totally thinks Tim did it. Lewis's mother We thinks... interviewed her last time and she's like, Tim did it. Yeah. And what does his mom say? A lot that we kind of dismissed and didn't pay attention to. There were lots of reasons we've been skeptical about the reports of Tim Fisher's possible involvement in this case. The statements about him in the case file were really just all rumors, none of them corroborated in any way. Probably the biggest reason we were skeptical, though, was that we hadn't understood how Tim Fisher was supposed to fit into the story. There was no indication in the police file that he'd even known Renee. We'd always planned to talk to him eventually, but this line of investigation hadn't been a priority. That morning, though, we'd interviewed Tim's brother, Lewis. And at the end of the interview, Lewis said he was heading over to Tim's that afternoon, and while he was there, he'd see if Tim wanted to meet with us and talk about Renee's case. Okay, well, what's the line of questioning, assuming this guy wants to come and sit down? We get him to talk. I'm Susan Simpson. And I'm Jacinda Davis. I'm an attorney and investigator. And I'm a true crime TV producer. And this is Proof, Season 2, Murder at the Warehouse. Proof is a Red Marble Media production in association with Glassbox Media. New episodes are released on Mondays, 
And on Thursdays, you can catch our sidebar episodes where we talk about the case, talk to guests, and tell you more about what's going on behind the scenes. You can find additional materials about this case on our website at proofcrimepod.com. This is episode 13, A Blonde and a Brunette. From very early on in the police investigation into Renee's murder, Tim Fisher's name had started popping up. It appears in the case file several times, often in connection with something we've been calling the sister story. There's this story about the sisters these sisters and Renee going over to the house and then Renee was killed there and then taken to the Home Depot. And that's something we've heard from several people. Yeah. It's kind of pieced together from a lot of sort of sketchy sources, but there's definitely was this rumor going around town that Renee was killed by this group of friends who then drove her body to the Home Depot and left it there. I mean, we had kind of just been shrugging it off a little bit. Yeah. Like, you read the file, and you're like, what the hell is this nonsense about the sisters? And then when we finally got to Manteca, stuff kept not even pointing that way, like shoving us that way. Even though it feels a little bit like a harebrained wild goose chase at times. The sister's story is not so much a story as it is a collection of rumors and fragmented police reports. Basically, there have been a lot of people over the years who have talked about how Renee's death might be connected to a house on Pestana Avenue, where two sisters lived. It wasn't the sisters themselves who were necessarily the focus of these rumors, but there are a lot of people in Manteca who believe something happened at the house where they were living. So who is this that said she was killed at the sister's house? Eric Greer. And he's the one who recorded the video and then ended up hit by the car. Yeah. Eric Greer is the first person we know of who told the police about the sister's house. Detectives finally spoke to him in July of 2000, but they don't seem to have taken his report seriously. That's why, in 2002, after Ty was convicted, Ty's friend Sid Reams had set up a video camera and recorded a statement with Eric Greer about what he knew. In the videotape, Eric described how on Friday, June 2nd, he'd gotten arrested after a fight at the pub. And when he was released from jail a few days later, he'd gone over to the sister's house on Pestana Avenue, where he was staying at the time. The events he describes next occurred on Tuesday, June 6th, the day after Renee's body was found. Jamie and Jolie's house, it was their house. And um, when I got there, after I got released from jail, um, my friend Liam, which was um, Julie's boyfriend, um, he was laying on the ground crying. And Julie's sister, Jamie, was in the back room pulling her hair out of her head. And uh, I went in there and questioned her, asked her what happened, and all she could say was they killed her, they killed her. Jamie told you they killed her. Now, did she ever say who they she were? Didn't say no. I didn't have time. Her sister started punching her. Yeah. Okay. And so then, after she punched her a few times, then what did Jamie say to you? They didn't say anything. They shut me out of the room. After a few hours had passed, and I, uh, w- once they came out of the room, I told them they were all crazy because she tried to tell me that she never told me that. Well, I had just got out of jail. I was completely sober. I wasn't on any drugs, on nothing. So I know that that's what she told me. Okay. That day at the sisters' house, Eric Greer had not known what was going on or what the sisters were talking about. He'd just been confused and a little alarmed. It was a little later on that Eric saw something in the sisters' house that alarmed him even more. A backpack and a pair of white tennis shoes tossed into a closet in one of the bedrooms. That's when Eric reported what he knew to the police. I believe it was a Jansport. I don't know. I just remember the shoes saying Keds, and they were white. And white. I know they weren't her shoes because I stayed in that room. Okay. So, and that, that was a room that was in that house on Pestana. Yeah. So 
somehow those kids and that backpack got in there. From right, some... and when the officers got there, they came back and talked to me again. They said it wasn't there. Well, when I was there, I know it was there because I seen the stuff sitting there. You had mentioned a gentleman by the name of Tim Fisher. He's the one that a lot of people thought was uh, the one who did it, and it's quite possible he's one of the ones who was involved in it, too, because they're all a really close group of friends. Now, uh, this is almost two years later. What do you think happened? I'm still stuck on the opinion of that group of people, the story that I told, that they, I don't know exactly what happened, but that's the people right there that it happened with. I don't know which one, but one of those people are the one who did it. A lot of people strongly believe that it was a very poor investigation. Okay. And so, uh, whew, pretty heavy, huh? Yeah. Are you scared about telling this stuff? No, I'm not. Not one bit whatsoever. Okay. And uh, I'm not a professional interrogator or anything, so I'm just trying to get it out that you can't think of anything else. No. All right. That's Eric Greer, and that's his story from right here in uh, Manteca. Hopefully uh, that leads some, or sheds some light on on the possibility that there is someone else out there that might have actually done that uh, murder and uh, not Ty Lopes. Ty's friend was trying to do what he could to help by videotaping the statement. But like he says, he was not a professional interrogator. And there are a lot of potentially important questions that go unasked in this interview. There's one question in particular I wish Eric Greer had been asked, and that's why. Why did he believe Tim Fisher could be involved in Renee's murder? On the tape, Eric says he thinks Tim was connected, and the one many suspect of actually killing Renee. But he doesn't explain why he thinks this, or who he heard it from. And we can't ask Eric about it now. He died in 2003 after being struck by a car on a stretch of highway connecting Manteca to the nearby town of Escalon. The same stretch of highway we were driving down now on our way to hopefully talk to Tim Fisher. Also, just a quick note for our listeners. A lot of the audio you're going to hear in this episode was recorded in the car or on the fly. And a lot of it was stuff we had not anticipated might actually end up on the show so we weren't taking extra care while recording. As a result, some of the audio you're going to hear may be a little bit rough, but we decided even with that, it'd be better to play our live responses in the moment, even if the audio quality is sometimes questionable. So, you know how like, some stories they take on a life of their own and they seem really far-fetched, but people really, really believe this story and there's different versions but maybe there's some like elements of truth to it on our way to hopefully interview tim we explained to kevin and dan why we were both skeptical of and intrigued by the sister story and how it was something we'd heard about from a lot of people in manteca there's a town with a lot of rumors this story about the backpack and being at someone else's house when she's murdered though there's more people who either heard it directly from one of the sisters or someone at the house or, you know, knew someone who was involved versus the Home Depot party story where nobody knows anyone who was at the party. Like a lot of people know about the sister story. Specifically saying they heard from the sisters? Well, from others involved in, the, in this whole pantheon of nonsense. It could be nothing. It could I mean, it's something. Maybe they, like, freak themselves out over nothing. I don't know. The whole sister story, the various permutations of it, they often include something about how she's killed at the sister's house, but by her ex-boyfriend who she wouldn't have sex with. And we're like, okay, but why would her ex-boyfriend be at the sister's house? The thing about the sister story is that no one in Manteca seems to agree on what exactly the story is supposed to be. Some people describe the incident at the sister's house as a threesome gone wrong. Others talked about Renee getting tricked into a bad situation by a boyfriend with a drug debt to repay. While still others told us they'd heard Renee had been killed after she refused to have sex with someone. But every version of the story has the same problem. 
So the sisters thing never quite made sense because like, how the hell would a Renee be with the sisters? I never bought the idea she went with Bertha Reason. That didn't happen. And we, we didn't know of any connection between the sisters groups and any of Renee's groups. There was, there was none, or so it seemed. That's why we were skeptical of the story. But at the same time, we wondered still. Because it did seem like Renee might have gone somewhere the day she went missing. But if so, where? Theoretically, she could have gone to hang out at some place like the sister's house. But imagine Renee, you know, it's... She can't find Jake. She gets, she leaves labor ready. She can't find Jake. She's walking around. She bumps into her ex-boyfriend. And he's like, come chill for a little bit. We've always wondered, like, who... Where could she have gone? Or who would she have been with? Or she's not seen walking around anywhere that day. Even if Renee somehow had known the sisters, though, and she ended up at their house some way, we still had no idea how Tim Fisher fits into any of this. If he fits into any of this. Nothing in the case file showed a clear connection between Tim and the sisters. And other tips called in about Tim Fisher don't mention the sisters at all. One of those tips came from a woman identified only as Jenny, no last name given who told the police something that sounded potentially significant. She said that Tim had been seen with Renee two days before Renee died. But the detectives never spoke to Jenny. And with just the name Jenny to go on, we hadn't been able to find her. But maybe we'd be able to find out from Tim Fisher who this Jenny was and find her that way. And maybe we'd be able to get some answers to our questions about the sister story. Customers are rushing to your store. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it um, a real POS? And if it is, you need Shopify for retail. Shopify POS is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. With Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. Get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's POS Go mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash proof true crime, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash proof true crime to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash proof true crime. New England is known for its charming towns, comforting foods, and of course its historical contributions, but the Down East region can have a dark side. I'm investigative journalist Kylie Lowe, and on my weekly podcast, Dark Down East, I dig into both decades old and modern day cases from my home state of Maine and the greater New England area. In each episode of Dark Down East, I seek insight from law enforcement officials, family members, and other loved ones, who are both deeply familiar with the cases and the individuals at the heart of them. Join me as I unveil intricacies of these stories that are often overlooked, honor the grit of those searching for justice, and shine a light on cases that you aren't hearing on other podcasts. Listen to Dark Down East now, wherever you're listening. He would lie his way into their dreams. He was looking for James Bond girls. How fun would that be to be a Bond girl? Then twist them into a nightmare. 
This guy has done this before. He'll do it again. Until a group of women banded together to put him behind bars and keep him there. You have to participate fiercely, fiercely in what happens next. I'm Keith Morrison, and this is Murder in the Hollywood Hills, an all-new podcast from Dateline. Listen to Murder in the Hollywood Hills for free each week or subscribe to Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or DatelinePremium.com to unlock new episodes one week early. The reason Lewis was part of this case had nothing to do with his brother Tim Fisher. Lewis had also been friends with Jake Silva and ended up as a witness for the prosecution. Though at trial, Lewis had recanted a story he'd told detectives about once hearing Jake at Matarinay and tell her, I'll kill you, bitch. That's why, earlier that morning, we'd met with Lewis at our hotel to interview him for the podcast. Lewis was aware that we'd heard rumors about his brother's possible involvement in Renee's death. After all, his own mother told us that she suspected that Tim had killed Renee. But in our interviews with him, Lewis had drawn a firm line. He would not talk to us about Tim except to tell us that we should talk to him. That's why Lewis had offered to talk to Tim and find out if he'd come meet with us to talk about the case. But Tim does not know that Lewis is coming to say, hey, I just talked to these two women who do a podcast and they want to talk to you about the day. Well, yes and no. Yes and no. (laughs) Tim was aware that Lewis had been in Antica meeting with someone. Because in the middle of our interview with Lewis, Tim happened to give him a call. Did you ever think Jake did it? No. So at her funeral, I was sitting next to him, and Chris, some that's three. So at the funeral, did you know going in? There's Tim. There's a place. We'd hit the pause button on the recorder, and Lewis answered the phone. Tim was calling to see if Lewis wanted to come by later that afternoon, and they started making plans to meet up. But after chatting to Tim for a moment, Lewis had looked at me and kind of smirked. He put the phone on speaker and then said, Hey, Tim, guess where I am now? Like, Tim called while we were there t- interviewing him. And he, he's like, oh, I'm in a hotel room with two ladies right now, a blonde and brunette. Okay, he said, I'm at the hotel with some hookers. Oh, he did actually say that. And <laughs> Tim was like, oh, that sounds good. Should I come over? And Tell yeah, me what they look we like. like. What do they look like? And he's like, one blonde, one brunette. Lewis had been making fun of me and Jacinda. He described the scene to Tim and how he was sitting there in a hotel room with a brunette and a blonde and invited Tim to guess wildly about what was going on. Lewis thought it was really funny. It kind of was. But then Tim mentioned he was driving out in the high waist of Manteca, past a cemetery there. And Lewis said, oh, you're out by the cemetery where Renee Ramos is buried? Tim's response made me realize that my assumptions in this case had been off the mark. I'm not going to try to imitate his tone of voice. I don't think I can. But in response to Lewis mentioning where Renee was buried, what Tim said was, she was fucking sweet. It was the way Tim said it that convinced me instantly Renee was not a stranger to him. He had known her, somehow. Suddenly, the whole conversation seemed a lot less funny. So now he's going over to Tim's house and he knows Tim is going to be like, oh, how are the hookers? And he's going to say, actually, I was talking to these women who are working on a story about Renee and they want to talk to you. When you're offered a chance to meet with a witness, it's usually best just to jump on the opportunity. Even if you weren't planning on speaking to them quite yet and aren't entirely prepared. That's what we were doing now. We had not planned on speaking to Tim that day, but it'd be good to hear from him and find out what he had to say. I mean, maybe it's probably all bullshit and we can rule it out and move on our merry way, so. We got to the restaurant and waited. Tim Fisher showed up not long after. So when I called Louie earlier yeah. and he was like, yes, I got this blonde brunette here. We're sitting there rolling Do our eyes at Do you want to know what I thought? What? I was like, oh my God. You're in a room with two hookers again? <laughs> That's what he said, yeah. He said he was. And we're sitting there And staring. I even asked him, what's the brunette look like? And he's like, oh, I mean, she's all right. No, actually, what he... He was talking Kevin, to me shit. I Kevin, was laughing. You know what he actually said? He asked what the brunette looks like, and she... Yeah, he goes, she got a chubby ass. No, 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 no Louie right? looks over and says, she's old. <laughs> he 
did not say that. <laughs> yeah, he did. Uh, <laughs> no? He did say that. She just he did, did not say that. We all sat down around the table in an empty corner of the restaurant. And after introducing ourselves, Tim explained what Lewis had told him about what we were doing in town. So Louie came over and told me that they're still doing an investigation or something because nobody really believes like some of those people are guilty. Or just trying to find out the truth, period, probably, you know? I love Lewis, but I kept telling him, you know, I think your friend's guilty, man. So I'm gonna ask, like, did you ever warn him, like, buddy, this is not a good idea? Hanging yeah. with Jake. No, Louis, that's one tough freaking son of a bitch right there. Okay, so you're not worried about Louis. <laughs> no. Me when I was younger and I'd talk wrong to some of my girlfriends and shit. You fat bitch and shit. Louis would be like, damn, that ain't even cool. I was like, well, I can't stand her. She's a cheater. She pisses me off. Then get away from her. You know, like Louis, he had a good side. He's a real tough kid, but he had goodness to him. Tim told us when Louis would try to talk to him about Renee's case and how his friend Jake hadn't killed her. He'd hear Lewis out on it. But Tim wasn't convinced Lewis was right. Louis always claimed his innocence. I don't know. So Louis knew him really good. I didn't. But did he kill somebody? I don't know. But all I do know, I felt like he was possibly capable of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, he but that doesn't make somebody guilty. Tim had only met Jake a couple of times, and the only real conversation he could recall having with him took place a few weeks after Renee's death, when he'd given Jake and Lewis a ride up to Stockton. Tim told us he'd use the opportunity to find out more about Jake's possible involvement in Renee's murder. We had Jacob in the car, you know, so I was asking him questions, because I had the thought of beating him up, because I loved her so much, you know, as a friend. Oh, well, turns out Tim Fisher did know Renee. We'd been wrong in thinking they hadn't known one another. Because they'd been friends for years. She was such a cute girl. Mm. If she was around my age, I would have been like, no, I want to go out with you. Tell that kid to kiss my ass. He can beat me up if he can, but I'll try. But I would have tried to save her. She deserved a good guy and a good life. And I was praying, just get away from this guy. I just didn't never felt good about him. She was adorable. I look at her mom's picture all the time when I'm talking to her and stuff on Facebook, and I just look at her and I go, I see where she got that little snaggle too. You know her mom? Yeah, she's on my Facebook. Donna? Tim told us he'd known Renee and her friends probably ever since they were 13 and 14 years old and running around Lincoln Street together. She had a great group of friends. They were all sisters. She seemed like maybe the one that was a little bit lost compared to the other ones. I'd see her walking around yeah. town. Did she stand out? Yeah. She didn't really belong on the streets. She didn't, she wasn't a bad person. I didn't see her doing drugs. She didn't look bad. She was just merely walking around like she lost. Renee wasn't the most popular out of them all, but I felt like it tore them all apart when that happened to her. It did. It definitely changed their lives too. I always look at those pictures where they're all like sitting in shopping carts at 14 years old, 15. And I just laugh. I never even knew she was down the street here in that cemetery. Do you remember the last time you ever saw Renee? I don't know if it's the last time, but I'll always have this memory of her right by Janice Music right by the 133 Club, and she was walking on that side of the sidewalk. I just remembered I looked at her and I just thought, oh, fuck, what are you doing? Why are you walking around? You have so many awesome friends. Like, why aren't you in a car with uh, three other pretty little girls driving around doing girl things? Was she alone? Yeah. Just by herself? Yeah. Just yeah. I knew exactly the location that Tim was describing about where he'd seen Renee that day, walking down Yosemite Avenue, heading eastbound. It was where Renee would have been walking if, after leaving Labor Ready on the morning she disappeared, she'd headed off towards the McDonald's, perhaps hoping to see if she had a paycheck there that she could pick up. Tim 
Tim was about 10 years older than Renee and her friends, but he'd gotten to know them because he'd often given them rides around town. He'd become sort of an older, trusted figure to them. As an example of that, he told us about this one time when Renee was maybe 15 years old, and she'd been hanging out in a field with a guy she'd once dated. She was like 15, and the Nick Graham Mason came over, Tim! Tim told us how Renee's friend Nick had come running up to him and asked for help, because Renee had gotten too drunk to walk. The Burger King that's still on Main Street had a field behind it with one little tree. And they went out there, and she drank like half a bottle of, of, of vodka out in the sun. And Nick came running to my house. Tim, I think she's dying. I knew her before that. That's why when he came to me and said, Renee's in the field, and she drank most of my bottle, you I was crying. like, oh, my God. Yeah. Not on my watch. And I ran as fast as I could to that damn field, and I swooped her up. And <laughs> she's just, oh, I got all mad at Nick. You better not ever give her no shit like that again, man. I just picked her up, carried her all the way to... Oh, you uh, literally carried her because she yeah, was... Yeah, like two city blocks. Because she was So wasted. she peed on this arm. I'll never forget as long as I live. Her, her rear was right here and she peed on my arm. I was like, just kept walking. She got so heavy. If you ever tried to carry somebody that's only 100 pounds or so, two city blocks. Tim told us he'd heard things about the case over the years but that he didn't know that much about it or how Jake Silva had been convicted. But he'd always assumed there must be some kind of solid evidence proving Jake's guilt. I kept telling Louie, man, your friend's guilty. He's like, no, man, I'm telling you, Tim. They got no evidence on him. I was like, bullshit, they had to, Louie. They don't put people away forever unless you fucking did something. We asked him what he had heard about what had happened to Renee. I heard she was strangled. Yes. I was hoping it wasn't painful for her. I was like, okay, oh my God. My first thought was, oh, he choked her unconscious. He choked her and let his friends rip her and then they killed her. Did, Did he accidentally kill her by choking her too much and didn't mean for that to happen? Oh, you thought it was an accident maybe? Well. Yeah, because I was thinking, like, this kid's super violent, but would he just want to kill his girlfriend? Or was he like, you know, shut the fuck up, we're all tweaked out, we're all going to have sex with you, and then fucking killed her? Maybe. He initiated. Like, because a lot of people were having threesomes. A lot of these kids were just, you know, they were screwing around a lot. So I thought maybe that's how it started. Maybe she rejected somebody. I just figured he... He choked her and let everybody have sex with her. That's what I figured. Tim told us that's what he assumed had happened, but he hadn't known what the actual evidence in the case had been. I'm really curious. I never got enough of anything either. I think like I read one newspaper article or something way back in the days, and that was like it. And then, like I said, I had a domestic violence with my ex. She had not a scratch on her. I had to go do time, like a month, and then take 52 classes. So then I took these classes, and I'll never forget when they said, oh, yeah, we're going to watch a video today, and it's about this girl, Renee Ramos, from Antica. We knew exactly what video Tim was talking about, though we hadn't seen it ourselves. In 2010, prosecutor Charles Schultz's wife, along with some others, had produced a video called Love You to Death about the dangers of teen dating violence. It tells the stories of three girls murdered by their boyfriends, and one of the cases featured was Renee's. The video is described as graphic. It features photos of the crime scenes and the victims' autopsies. This video was originally intended for adolescent girls to educate them on the dangers of abusive relationships. But apparently, this video was also being shown to domestic abusers who were taking court-mandated domestic violence classes. I'll never forget, I told the counselor, yeah, I really don't want to see that, and especially anything graphic, because I knew Renee. Well, you know, it's part of the class, you want to graduate, you want to go back to jail, You have to watch the video, and I'll never forget how upset I got when it was like a flash. I think they showed Renee in that video, 
and I turned my head and I said, I fucking thought I told you. Like at that point, I was ready to go back to jail because now you're fucking with my feelings, you know? And I was like, okay, fuck you too, buddy. And like, maybe you don't understand. I don't want to see this. I'm Samantha Cole, host of the new season of Understood, The Pornhub Empire. Over the course of four episodes, I'll tell you how a horny YouTube knockoff in Canada came to dominate the porn world, only to shatter their cheeky reputation in a massive scandal. The Pornhub Empire is a new season of Understood from the CBC. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. Do you find yourself captivated by the inexplicable, entranced by enigmas, and tantalized by the unknown? We are Shane and Josh Waters, brothers who will weave you through tales that have mystified us for years. From haunted hotels to inexplicable disappearances, Our episodes offer you a panoramic view of the world's greatest mysteries, leaving no stone unturned, no clue unnoticed. With a gripping narrative, we invite you to join us on a journey into realms of the unexplained. We're unraveling the mysteries that have perplexed humanity for ages. So, armchair detectives, curious minds, and seekers of the strange, it's time to put on your headphones and dim the lights. Dive into the uncanny world of the Mystery Inc. podcast and prepare for a journey into the unknown that you'll never forget. And remember, some mysteries are better left unsolved, but not unexplored. Hey, Susan here with a new podcast you should check out. From ISIS insurgents to MS-13 hitmen, Nigerian traffickers to Indian dons, Danny Gold and Sean Williams have met a lot of shady people in the past decade. Learn about how they survived dangerous investigative work and the facts behind transnational criminal networks in the Underworld podcast. Each week, journalists Danny Gold and Sean Williams use their experience to take listeners on a global tour of mobsters, warlords, and crooks, from Brooklyn to Beijing, from the streets to the boardrooms, and everywhere in between. Underworld is a fascinating show about heroes, villains, and the barely visible mafias that affect our lives, whether we know it or not. At Underworld, you can find out everything from Griselda Blanco and the Miami Drug Wars to how bootlegging works all over the world, from North Korea to Pakistan. Come here behind the curtain of society and see what really lies beneath. Tune into the Underworld podcast to hear all inspiring stories of organized crime. Find the Underworld podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tim told us he had never known what the actual evidence against Jake and Ty had been. He just assumed that one of the people involved in the murder must have cut a deal and told on the others. That's usually how these things go, after all. When he heard about the actual evidence used at trial, he wasn't impressed. There were 20 to 40 kids and at least 15 to 20 there when it happened. When it happened? Mm Mm-hmm. And they just, I guess, watched. Some were doing like skateboard tricks next to her as it was happening. No yeah, I was freaking gonna say, way. does that sound plausible to you? There's no evidence the party ever happened. Yeah. No? No. No evidence at the Home Depot where they said they were all partying? There no wasn't bottles, a bunch of cigarette butts? No cigarettes. DNA? No, no, no DNA. So part of the problem in this case was that they never decided when the party happened or when she was actually killed. So Jake was left to account for a whole week because they, they don't ever say when the party happened. That kid didn't have a night? It was Friday night. No, they, no, they didn't know what night is. <laughs> There's no way you could have a party with somewhere between 20 and 40 people and not have evidence of it. Everywhere. Tim told us he'd never heard about Josh Burroughs and his story about the 20 to 40 teenagers partying at the Home Depot. I heard it was her and four guys at Home Depot. I never heard anything about a big party. I just heard it was her with four guys, so I figured it was her and Jacob, and I figured Jacob brought three of his buddies. What about Ty Lopes? What do you know of him? All I've ever heard on the streets as a kid is he's just some old piece of shit. Tim told us he didn't know much about Ty, but he'd heard about his death back in 2011. 
and I'm watching TV and all of a sudden it's Ty Lopes got murdered, the killer of it, and I'm just watching the TV and I'm going, oh shit, like wow. Because everybody kept saying, well, Ty Lopes wasn't even there. Ty Lopes never, Ty Lopes, well, that was all <laughs> fake. That was all made up. What were the other theories people were throwing out there? Oh, that, that none of them were there. Jacob wasn't even there. Yeah, those other guys, they had all these weird names, guys I'd never heard before. Like who? I can't remember. That was 30 years ago or something now. And like a lot of people were thought to be suspects. You know, one time or another, did you hear any other sort of names on the street of other people who could have done it? Yeah, but I never remembered their names. It was so hard trying to remember because I'm trying to piece it together, you know, like, and the stories were just always different. Did you hear about her being missing before she was Ooh. found? Renee. Missing? Yeah, because she was missing for a week. You remember that? No. She was missing for a long time before her body was found. Well, I knew that because, like, they didn't kill her and, and they found her overnight, right? Tim doesn't live in Manteca anymore, but he described to us the Manteca he remembers from when he did live there and why he's not shocked something could have gone wrong in Renee's case. It was a very small town. It was very old school. A lot of tweakers, a lot of math. The cops would let you get away with about anything. I used to tell people all the time, they'll let you get away with anything in this town second to murder. Drug dealing, I've had them come to houses, I swear on everything I love. Walk right in the front door with no search warrant. We're looking for somebody. Look down at the table and just see thousands and thousands of dollars worth of five different kinds of hard drugs and go, we're not even here for that. You guys know this guy and this guy and this guy. That's cool. You guys go back to your thing and walk right out the door. I was like, Manteca was a hard place to grow up, Tim told us. That's why he now lives elsewhere. Though, he said, there is one thing about Manteca he does miss. Manteca taught me all wrong. I thought I could get away with anything. Anytime I went to that town or that town or that town, I wound up in jail. But Manteca you never did? <laughs> yeah, no. Manteca was like, you do whatever you want. Go somewhere else, it's like, oh, fuck, I can't do that here. <laughs> That's not what I was taught. So yeah, let's say I ever wind up single again. Uh-huh. <laughs> Susan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't follow. I, I just like what you said. She's like, I don't know what the hell he was trying to say. So let's just say, <laughs> what's my chances? One in a million? <laughs> I ain't coming like, to Manteca for no one. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're saying there's a chance. No. <laughs> you are sweet, though. I like that. You can do that. <laughs> what a jerk, Kevin. Early on in our conversation with Tim, he mentioned some of his friends from that time period. And I thought it was a little curious whose name he chose to bring up. Eric Greer. You heard that name? I've heard of him, yeah. I heard he was pushed out of a car that, or he, someone made him jump to his death. I always heard before that that he jumped just to jump out of a car and kill himself. He didn't jump. What do you mean he didn't jump? He got ran over by a car? He didn't jump. I heard the story was they were driving past Old Town Bar out here. From what I've been told, he tried to cross the road and didn't make it. Because that was another really good friend of mine. Me and him were homeless together as kids. We were sleeping in my Dotson. Imagine sleeping in a tiny little... 72, 510 Dotson. With you? <laughs> Seats laid all the way back. We were cuddled up like we were two little fetal positions. I remember I'd look over at him. We were, it sounds romantic. Yeah, <laughs> it pretty much was. He was real cool, though, to me and some people. If he trusted you and he knew, you know, like, no matter what we do, like, I could trust you. You said earlier that you had heard he had been pushed out of the car. Like, yeah. why would someone have pushed him out of the car? Probably drugs and money and things fear there's a lot of a lot of reasons eric had people were scared of him that he wasn't cool with but you'd heard he got pushed yeah i always heard he got he jumped or pushed out of a car 
that's why I was so irritated because like I leave town I got my life together I'm doing I'm like I'm never going back to Manteca all of a sudden what happened Eric died did you ever hear any talk that he was killed because of this case no okay no I know Eric very well I would bet both my arms and legs right now that he had nothing to do with anything like this Renee's death no way no way you think he could have known anything though Possibly could have known something. Because he hung out in some bad places. I think the last time I seen him was at this girl, these two girls. It was like Julie and Jamie. Mm-hmm. These girls had a house, and Eric's like, come on, I got this. It's a nice place. Right over here behind the old racquetball club. So Eric's like, you can come hang out here with me. And we were like couch surfers, you know? Tim's response here caught our attention. Because all Susan had asked was if Tim thought Eric Greer could have known something about Renee's death. And Tim immediately launched into a story about staying at the sister's house. The house that was the center of so many rumors about Renee's death. By this point in the interview, we knew we would need to talk to Tim Fisher again. We realized he might be more important to this case than we'd thought. But before we confronted Tim with what we knew about Eric Greer and the sister's house, we needed to go back and prepare. We needed to make sure we understood the record ourselves before we tried to ask him about it. We'd have to hope we'd get a chance to meet with Tim again so that we could ask all the questions that we weren't ready to ask about just yet. So y'all hung out over there? Yeah, me and Eric, I remember we were sitting there and I was looking at him. I just remember thinking to myself, this isn't, this isn't the end of my road, but this might be the end of his road. This might be where, where his road stops. And he says, this is, this is my life. But I thought, oh, I'm going to be here for a few days. I don't think I'm going to screw with either one of these girls. Yeah, you girls are cute, but you're not going to be cute for long. But Eric sat there and just looked at me like, yeah, yeah this, this is my life. This, part of, this is it, you know? Tim did not elaborate any further on why he thought Eric might have heard rumors about Renee's murder. But there were lots of rumors going around back then. I bet anybody that knew her that wasn't a great character at the time was accused. You know what I mean? There were so many rumors going around, like I said. And at the time, smoking weed all day at every house I went to and trying not to do meth and everything else, I was having a hard time keeping up with the rumors and remembering what part was from what, from who, from said what. Some of those rumors were even about Tim himself. Tim told us how three of his neighbors on Level Way had once thought that he might be involved in Renee's death. One time I had a friend and he, he was into uh, some X-rated music or this black guy, X-rated, whatever they call him. And so he wrote on the skateboard because I was a skater, bitch kill us or something from this song, right? This was at the same time Renee was, was murdered. So I actually got jumped over my friend's murder one, one night. A bunch of guys kept coming up to me, and one guy, Billy Volk, was crying, choke me, choke me to death. And I'm just standing in the street going, what are you doing? And then when it snapped and clicked what they were talking about, it was too late. They were already trying to kick the shit out of me. And I didn't see the big Ernie guy go around behind me, but he hit me right here. I'll never forget, right behind your ear where you feel that bone on your skull. He punched me pretty good right there. Like, I had to run over to a construction truck and grab a big little crowbar and tell him, batters up, you know, you're not kicking my ass. Wait, I'm a little confused because, oh, because of the skateboard. Because of the skateboard, and I'm standing there and we're all... So they're, like, thinking you... Yeah, yeah, well, he knew her. Well, look what a skateboard says. So they, like, jumped to conclusions and tried to, like, beat the shit. Yeah, and I think by the very next morning, they realized the mistake they made because everybody knew my innocence. Did anyone else point the finger at you? No, just those three idiots that one night. I think they had too much to drink. (laughs) Let me ask you guys something. Do you guys feel Jacob's innocent? Or could be? There might be a chance? I feel very strongly the case of trial is not the real case because whatever happened to her, there was Josh Burroughs' story is not the true story. After hearing about Josh Burroughs and his testimony at trial, Tim was curious. Who was this 14-year-old that claimed to have witnessed Renee's murder? Could there have been any truth to it? 
I just can't believe this kid said there was some big ass party and then he went and dug and buried a bunch of stuff. And you got a picture of him? What's this kid look like? I know well, we I've could, seen it. We his... could show you the video. Really? I want to see it. Yeah, I'm, I don't have it with me. Are you around uh, tomorrow? I mean, it is Mother's Day. Right, well, maybe if we get it later, we can do it. Well, because I'd like to see this video. I'd like yeah. to hear. Yeah. Like I've watched, like I said, almost every episode of the first 48. I might, I might be able to solve some shit. Maybe around later or tomorrow? Oh, I'm dying to see it. We'll just ping you later and we'll figure it out. Like whenever you have time. Yeah, don't go flying off without me now. I won't. <laughs> All the way from New York City. We left the restaurant with tentative plans to meet up with Tim again the next day. So Dan, are you recording? Yeah, I'm recording. So what do you guys think? Something's really wrong here. Oh, he knows something. He has to. The way he's acting, the way he wants to be involved again, the way he wants to know what we know. I don't know that. Well, well he didn't want to be involved again for a minute because he said, I don't know that I can do it tomorrow. As sort of as when we said we have this video, that's when he became curious. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. He wants, he'll do it again for more info. Dan, you're not seem, you don't seem convinced. Yeah, no, I, I don't know. Like, which part do we know is false from what he said? It's not about what's false, it's about what's true that he said. The reports about Tim Fisher in the case file had initially struck us as implausible, because this whole theory required Tim Fisher and Renee to somehow end up at the sister's house together. Only, how would that have ever happened? While we were talking to Tim, though, he had confirmed that the theory itself wasn't implausible at all. Renee and Tim had hung out. He'd often given her rides around town, and he'd known the sisters. He'd stayed at their house, even. So the basic idea of Tim and Renee hanging out together at the sister's house, well, that by itself wasn't outlandish. I asked him where they hung out, and he, he's like, oh, you know, we didn't really hang out, but... Uh, no, he's at people's houses, like... I asked where they hung out with her. He couldn't give an answer. Yeah, but I don't know, what's the... He, what's the... I guess I don't understand what the this issue is. This guy's watching her and keeps an eye on her. Yeah, but the, he tells one story of just, like, he, they were near where she was passed out in a field, and he brought her home. Outside of that, he doesn't talk about really seeing her he hang says, out at all. He said he always saw her around, told her why you hang out with Jake. He said, like, once. He told her, hey, you shouldn't hang out with that guy. This guy is way too fixated. I don't know. I guess to me, I it's, I, I don't know how much of a fixation. We're there to talk about Renee. Mm -hmm. So he's talking about Renee. I thought it was interesting the way he kept saying, Renee didn't deserve to live on the streets. As if that... You know, not, R Renee didn't deserve to be murdered. R Renee didn't deserve to die. Like, she didn't, he kept saying she didn't deserve to live on the streets. We all agreed that Tim had said some odd things, but we weren't at all convinced that he'd said anything that was actually incriminating. Saying a few odd things isn't proof of anything. And the fact that it's plausible Renee and Tim could have hung out together at the sisters doesn't mean that ever actually happened. Y'all really didn't have your fucking, like, hackles raised that whole conversation? No, I, I did, but... But I'm telling you, this something is very, very, very wrong here. And I know y'all aren't apparently not feeling it, but... I, I, I'm not saying that I'm not feeling it. I'm also wondering about reading in some of these other things, right? Like, because once you get it in your mind that he could be involved, you start... Yeah, once you get that idea, everything he does becomes suspect. Yeah. I was thinking of it like um, the statements he's made, the evidence we have, we've seen people be convicted on less. Yes. Like, yeah, just, just ask Jeff Titus. Very... Kevin is right. When you're suspicious of someone, everything they do suddenly becomes suspicious, no matter how mundane it may be. We have certainly covered enough cases where that has led to the wrong person being convicted. And I was definitely having that problem with Tim Fisher now. It wasn't any one thing Tim had said that spooked me, but as the interview had gone on, I'd found myself growing more suspicious and reading meaning into stray comments that maybe didn't have any deeper meaning at all. Y'all, the part that I almost died at was when he said he'd, when he'd last seen her. My heart fucking stopped. The place we parked last night, the place that we parked our car, 
to go into the 133 Club. That is where he saw her, next to that shop, walking down Yosemite, alone. And he said he could give her rides. He sees her walking down Yosemite. She's heading, she's probably going to McDonald's to get her check. When we asked him about the last time he'd seen Renee, he said he wasn't sure if it was the last time, but he described driving down Yosemite Avenue and seeing her walking down the sidewalk over by the music store. And he'd wondered to himself why Renee was out there in the streets looking lost. Why hadn't she just gone home to her friends and family? But what Tim was describing had unsettled me because it sounded awfully like something we theorized about before and trying to explain how Renee could have simply vanished after leaving Labor Ready that morning. Could someone have seen her walking down Yosemite and picked her up in their car? Is that why she'd seemed to disappear into thin air? And now there we were talking to Tim Fisher and he was describing a scenario where something just like that could have occurred. Tim didn't mention pulling over to talk to Renee or offering her a ride somewhere, but what if he had? Would she have gotten in the car with him? If something like that had happened, where would they have gone after? One of the stories says she actually was alive for a couple days. And that's, remember how surprised he looked when I said she'd been missing for a week? He didn't understand that she'd been missing at all. Yep, because she hadn't been. It was the way Tim had looked when he said this that had surprised me. He seemed truly, genuinely puzzled by what I was saying. He didn't seem to know that Renee had ever been considered missing. Again, I could tell I was reading too much into things that might not have any meaning at all. But there was at least one thing Tim told us where I felt strongly he'd not been entirely forthcoming. What about, he also puts himself at the house with the sisters and... Oh, he knows. This dude already knows so much more than he's pretending. Because we asked him multiple times about what were the other rumors and he never... Would not say a word. We've spoken to a number of people who were connected in some way to the sisters' house. And basically, all of them had heard something about the sister's story. Tim is the only one we've talked to who has said they'd known nothing about it. But Tim had been staying at the sister's house and called Eric a good friend. And yet, he'd somehow never heard anything about the rumors about that house on Pestana Avenue? He talked about... He always assumed that it was like a threesome that got out of hand at one point. He says something like that. And that is, in fact, the story, the sister story. Yes. And and so was he saying that because he knew the sisters and he knew the, the story or it just it, it was a it was a bizarre combination of the sister story and the police story. It's almost like he was combining them in his mind. We walked out of the interview with Tim Fisher feeling confident he'd known more than he was telling us about the rumors that had been going around town. But look, denying that you remember the town gossip about how you were involved in a murder doesn't mean you did the murder. It could mean you just don't like talking about the fact that there were rumors about you being somehow involved in your friend's murder. I don't know. I wasn't like thinking he did it. And then he started talking. And now, it was all so wrong. It's all I can say. And I know that's not proof. I'm not trying to make it proof. But my gut is telling me that that this, what he was saying, no. And his level of interest is off the charts. There's no one else in this case with so little connection to it who's been so intently intrigued and interested in what we have to say about it. Right. The accident idea is just, that's the most bizarre thing. I mean, no one has said that, right? This whole right, time we've been here. that she's accidentally killed. Yeah, no one has said it was an accident, and then Tim kind of up the gate. Whoever did that by accident must feel really bad. The interview with Tim Fisher had left me feeling unsettled for a lot of reasons. But that was also a problem, because it makes it harder to sort through what Tim had said that might actually have significance, and what was just me overreacting to him saying some weird things. 
I was also wondering if he just wanted us to think he had done it. Yeah, that crossed my mind, right? Like, does he want people to think that he did it and he thinks it's cool that people think he might have done it? Um, Because as we're talking, that sense of like, oh shit, did you do it? Started coming over me. I'm like, are you trying to make me feel that? Like, is that what you're trying to do? It's working, if so. Right, job well done, so. (laughs) I Um, didn't get that sense because it wasn't like blatant. I was a thousand percent ready to be like, good, the story's off our list, we can move on. And it, everything he said, like, it was just red flag party over there. And I'm not going to tunnel vision on him. Is that because he asked you if you're ever going to be single? No, you but could, that didn't uh... help. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I, I, we absolutely cannot focus on him, but I'm telling you, I talked to lots of people who are full of shit, and I expect everyone to be full of shit. This is different. All right, so how, what do you, how, how, do you, how do you get him to say something? We don't. He's not going to confess. We're not trying to get him to confess. We're trying to get him to block off whatever alternate explanations there are. To me, like, whenever I'm trying to get somebody to come out or I'm trying to get them to reveal something, I don't always want to rush in. I want to see what they do next. No, I'm not saying we rush in just decent chance this whatever happens tomorrow comes out in court one day. Very decent chance. Susan had been way too over-optimistic. Nothing that happened the next day would ever be relevant to any court proceeding. All right, well, wrapping up a bit early on our last day in Manteca. We've been here, it feels like, forever, but it's only been... Eight days. My left here? Yeah, left here. Um, Tim Fisher canceled on us. Unexpectedly, kind of, after he confirmed it. Yeah, but hopefully we can catch up with him on our next trip. Yeah, I mean, I'm not disappointed because I was kind of worried about what we were going to be doing. Yeah, I felt a little rushed, like we weren't quite ready. We well, could have we pulled it off if but we yeah, but to. we weren't. We had hoped to interview Tim again the following day, which happened to be Mother's Day. Prior plans kept Tim from making it out to meet with us again. But we made plans to meet with him on our next trip out to Manteca, which was better anyways, because by then, hopefully, we'd be better prepared to ask him more questions about the sister's story and the accusations Eric Greer made in his video. At this point, we weren't even sure how credible anything about the sister's story really was, We just knew we needed to find out more. But in the meantime, there were other leads we needed to turn our attention to. We've talked to enough people in this town. We know how rumors and stories and the cops plant seeds and they grow into these like elaborate, like, I don't know that I believe anything. That is as crazy to me as the party at the Home Depot. It was when I started in my head. But there is something there. It's more than just the crazy story it sounds like on paper. There is something there. Like, maybe it's gotten garbled beyond recognition, but there is a core truth to something about this. I still, above and beyond Tim, you know, if we're if we're looking at people of interest, yeah. right? Let's not even call suspects, yeah. people of interest. My number one is still the serial rapist. That, to me, just makes the most sense. Next week on Proof. As you know, I've been corresponding back and forth with um, Jared Conway, who's in prison out in California. I finally got a response. He's like, my brother's in prison for life, right? I'm like, yeah, he's, he's in California prisons. And he's like, California? I thought he was in prison in Tennessee. Erica just thought that somebody had strangled her on the couch with her necklaces, and this all came from one of the girls, whichever girl that dragged him into the room. I just remember riding around in his car and him smoking weed. I said, oh, so you're a bitch killer, so you had something to do with that? You had something to do with that, Murray? So why would you have that on your skateboard? I hit him. I just hit him out of nowhere.
You've been listening to Proof, a podcast by Red Marble Media in association with Glassbox Media. We'll be back next week with episode 14. Send us your questions and comments at ProofCrimePod at gmail.com. We'll respond during our bonus episodes, Proof Sidebar, on Thursdays. Kevin Fitzpatrick is our executive producer. Our webmaster is Clayton Brawley. And our theme music is by Ramiro Marquez. Audio production for this episode is by Michael Ulatowski and Steve Rentos. Our archivist is Amory Davis. Our social media manager is Skylar Park. Production assistance for this episode was provided by Maddox Southard. And thank you to our sponsors who make this podcast possible. Check out the show notes for special sponsor deals. And follow us everywhere with the handle at ProofCrimePod and on our website, ProofCrimePod.com. And lastly, a note to our listeners. If you have any information related to this case, we'd love to speak to you. No matter how small a detail it may seem, it just might be more important than you realize. You can reach us by email or leave us a voicemail at 929-267-3172. That's all for this week. Thanks so much for listening.